Well, good morning again. Thank you so much for being here. Starting a new sermon series this morning uh, called Waiting, Working, Witnessing. We're going to be going through the book of First and Second Thessalonians. Uh, First and Second Thessalonians are primarily known for one thing. They talk more about the second coming of the Lord than any other two books in the Bible. And most people don't know that. Most people think, oh, it's Revelation. That's where you go to talk about it. Nope, it's in First and Second Thessalonians. That's where it's mentioned in every chapter of First and Second Thessalonians. So we're going to spend some time there. But there's a lot of things to look at, and we're going to have a good time going through it together. I want us to start off thinking about warning signs. You guys ever seen warning signs out and about, or do you ignore them like a lot of society? When you see a warning sign, I... Um, I came across some warning signs, and I got their pictures. I want to show them to you. If you could show me the first one. This was, I thought this was interesting. Touching wires causes instant death, and then there's a $200 fine on top of that. <laughs> so, I'm just saying, you might want to pay attention to that one. Look at this one. Do not breathe under the water. That's their local pool here in Ohio. I don't know how you swim here in Ohio and Alabama. We were taught not to do that. But I don't, I don't know. Maybe it's a little different here. One more. This is kind of fun. Oh, that was really small. But it says, uh, no climbing. Alligators love kids, but they're hard to digest. So please do not climb on the barriers or walls. <laughs> so I'm just saying, there's some pretty interesting warning signs out there. And when we're looking in the scriptures, uh, many times uh, there are warnings that we find inside, inside the Bible. And I can think of, of probably the, 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 uh, the most uh, alarming or, or the most significant warning sign that we, that we have in Scripture was actually said by Jesus. And Jesus, talking in the book of Matthew one day, told a group of people, he said, there will be many who call me Lord, Lord, but they will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And to me, that's a pretty strong warning sign that there would be many people who would call him Lord, but yet they won't make it into heaven one day. And so as we start off our time in 1 Thessalonians, I want us to think about this idea of something that I call uh, and is called by others proof of life. How do we, how do we know that we're saved. If, if you've been in church a long time, we call it saved, you know? Uh, if, if, you're, if you want to know the biblical term for it, it's called born again. How, how do you know someone's born again? Uh, sometimes, uh, depending upon what, what area of the country that you might live in, sometimes they call it being lost. Someone is, how do you, how do you know you're not lost? Um, for those that, that don't go to church a whole lot, or maybe you're new to church, it would be how do you know you're going to heaven and not going to hell? That, so so those, are, those are all different ways of saying the same thing, and that basically is how do we know, how can we know if we are really going to go to heaven when we leave this life and enter into the next? And Paul deals with this in the very first chapter of First Thessalonians, I want to show you what I'm talking about. Uh, notice what Paul wrote. He said, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. And then notice this next comment. He says, for we know, brothers and sisters loved by God, that he has chosen you. So Paul says at the opening of this letter, the people that were reading this, he says, I know God has chosen you. I know you are saved. How did he know that? How do you know that? I mean, a lot of people walking around don't even know that about themselves. Much less do we know that about someone else. But Paul, in writing this letter, says, I know you 
have been chosen by God. It's another way of saying, I know you're saved. We're going to come back to it and talk about it in a moment, but notice what he goes on to say. He says, for we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but your, but, but your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we don't need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Oh, there's the first mention of Jesus coming back. Happens over and over and over again in 1 Thessalonians and in 2 Thessalonians. But we're going to unpack these verses and figure out why Paul could write a letter to this group of people. He wasn't even standing in front of them when he said it. He wrote them a letter and said, I know God has chosen you. I know God has saved you. How could he know that? How could he know that and write that with confidence? It must be true because it's in the scriptures, okay? And, it, and, and so, so we know something was going on in this passage to let him know that. And so there's, there's really six things that I want us to consider this morning that we find in this passage of how do we know if we're saved. The first one is, is that salvation changes our motivations, Salvation changes our motivations. This is one way we can know if we've truly been saved, if we've truly received Christ as our Savior. In verse 3, Paul says, notice, and I've highlighted some things to kind of help us remember along the way. He says, we remember. So in other words, Paul says, when I was with you, I remember this about you. I remember that your work that, that your work produced by faith, your love, uh, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by the hope of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's talking about what's motivating them to be who they are. What's motivating the things that they're doing? And first, he says, you know, your work was produced by faith. That word work, it points to anything we do that causes mental or physical exertion. Do you ever experience any of that? Mental or physical exertion? When we must mentally think about something and physically exert ourselves, that's what this word means. It's work. And we're not getting paid for it. Okay, we're going to talk about that word in just a minute. We, there, there's all kinds of work that we do that we do not get paid to do, correct? Yeah, every parent knows this, all right? There's all kinds of work that we do that we don't get paid for it. So what's our motivation for doing that? Paul says, the Thessalonians, that he saw their work and it was produced by faith. In other words, they were being motivated by their faith in God to mentally and physically exert themselves for the causes of Christ. He said, I see that in you. Then he said, it's not only their work that was motivated by faith, it was their, their, their labor that was prompted by love. Now, that word labor, that's a little bit different than work. That's why, that's why it doesn't say, I see your work that is promoted by faith and your work that is prompted by love. Labor's a little bit different. Labor implies that there's work that we do to get paid. We have those too, right? Right? There's work that you do that you get paid to do that. And that sometimes becomes a labor to us. But we keep doing it. Why? Because somebody's paying us to do it. And we, and we need that. So he says, I've seen your work that you did for nothing. And that was motivated by your faith in Christ. And I've also seen your labor. 
This sometimes, the work that we do, that the only reason we're doing it is because we know we're getting something from it. And he says, that work was prompted by love. And I saw that in you. In other words, love had become their currency. They, they, were, they, they did this, this stuff for one another because they loved one another, but they also knew they would receive love. So they labored at things, and love became the currency and is the currency or should be the currency among God's people. And it was motivating them to be and do what they were doing. He goes on to say, not only did, did he notice that their, their work was, was motivated by faith, their love, uh, that, that, that their labor was being prompted by love, but he says that, that their endurance, that it was inspired by hope. In other words, not only were they working and laboring, but they were enduring. They weren't quitting. They didn't, they didn't stop in their pursuit of living for Jesus. And, and he says, you know, and, and listen, I get it. Sometimes, even when we're getting paid to do something, how many of us have said, you know what, I don't care what I'm getting paid, it's not worth it. You ever done that? Yeah, it, I don't care what, it's not worth it. I'm not going to do this anymore. We lose our ability to persevere to endure because it's not worth it. Sometimes, sometimes even following the Lord, it feels like it's not worth it. But those who have been saved endure. They endure. And that endurance, that perseverance, that ability to stand and to keep on keeping on was inspired by their hope in Christ. That word hope, it means their, their confidence in Christ their trust in Christ, that, that the promises that he made, that even though in the moment they're not getting anything of any benefit to them, they're going to continue to persevere and endure because Christ has saved them. Why do we do what we do? We do not like to think about that. We do not like to think about why we do what we do. We just do. Many of us just react. We're just reacting to life and, and trying to manage it the best that we can. Paul's talking about this, this, this group of people. The reason that he knows they've been saved is because their, their, their faith, their, their work has been motivated by, motivated by faith. Their labor is being, is being prompted by love. Their, their endurance is inspired by their hope. Their motivations are different. I heard a story one time about a, a king, and there was a gardener inside the king who grew a magnificent carrot. And he took this carrot, and he gave it to the king. And the king was so touched by this gift of this magnificent carrot that he gave the gardener a large piece of land so that he could continue to grow produce. There was a nobleman who saw this unfold. He decided, you know what? I'm going to give something to the king. And so he went and he got his very best horse and he took it and he gave it to the king. The king took the horse, turned to the nobleman and said, thank you. And that was it. And the nobleman, he got upset. He said, king, I don't understand. The gardener brought you this carrot, and you gave him more land. I have brought you this horse, and all you've said is thank you. And the king said, the gardener gave the carrot to me for me. You gave the horse to yourself for yourself. And many times... That's what we do if we're not careful. People who have a relationship with Jesus Christ understand why they do what they do. Our motivations are changed. They're different. 
There's another thing that Paul points out in this passage about how someone might know they're saved. Salvation modifies our social network. In other words, it changes who we hang out with, who we run around with. It changes who we allow to influence us and who we're trying to influence. Notice what Paul said in verse 4. He says, brothers and sisters loved by God. Now, we might just read that as a, as a salutation as he's starting off. But here's what's interesting. The words brothers and sisters are used 19 times in 1 Thessalonians alone. Paul is driving home a point. Brothers and sisters, people of God, family of God, social group of God, whatever you want to call it. Brothers and sisters loved by God. God. See, we're going to talk more about this as we go through 1 Thessalonians, but the Christian community in Thessalonica at this time, uh, they were being ostracized. They, they were being canceled. They, they were being, uh, uh, you know, persecuted because of their allegiance to Christ and one another. Now, none of us sitting here have ever endured that. Not, not, not at the scale at which the Thessalonians were, were dealing with. The idea that, that if, I, if I go and, I, and I, am, I associate myself with people who claim to, to believe in Jesus and follow Jesus, and I have such close relationships with them that everyone else would make fun of us or persecute us or no longer come to our business, or fire me, or, or, or somehow threaten me and my family. See, none of us, none of us have dealt with that. And so the, the, idea, the idea behind this is, is that um, when, when someone, uh, when, when they're truly saved, their, their identity, whatever it was that identified them prior to salvation changes, and now their identity and, and their belonging is in, is in totally something else. So, for instance, if I'm born in America, I'm an American, okay? If I'm born in Alabama in America, I get a funny accent, okay? That, that's what happens. And so, and so here's, here's th those, those become the things that identify who I am until I get saved, and when I get saved, it doesn't mean that I'm no longer from America. It doesn't mean that I no longer grew up in Alabama. It doesn't mean that I lose my accent. It just means I now have a different association. I have a different group of people that I now identify myself with. And that should be a very strong social part of a saved person's life to be engaged in a body of believers. That's not abnormal. That's normal for those who have been saved by Jesus Christ. And that really challenges us. It challenges some of the most committed people who even call themselves Christians and go to church on a regular basis. Because in America today, to be considered someone who is faithfully committed to a local church, you only have to go once a month. And I'm not sure that's much of a local committed association. We are way more committed to our political parties, our social groups, our sports activities, our jobs, just our friends many times than we are to the fact that we belong in the family of God together. But that's how the saved act, and that's what Paul saw. Paul saw in this group, a group of people who, who were brothers and sisters. They had, a, they had a, almost like a family type of love for one another, and they, they were together. It was them against the world, and they were standing together. That's what saved people do. That's how we know. Third thing that Paul talks about in this passage 
is that salvation begins with God. If we continue reading verse 4, he says, For we know, brothers and sisters loved by God, that he has chosen you. So we kind of started off talking about that. He has chosen you. So there's a, there's a 50 cent religious word for this. It's called predestination. And there is a doctrine, it's a true doctrine, it's in the Bible, called the doctrine of predestination. The idea is that God has chosen people who are saved, and there are those who are not chosen. And people, uh, you need to understand something. And, and, and let me ask it this way. When someone gets saved, did God choose them, or did they choose Christ? Both. Both. Does God choose us or do we choose him? Both. It happens, it happens both ways. And so in this particular passage, um, Paul is saying, listen, I know God has chosen you, and he's telling them why he's chosen them. But, but here's what happens to us, this, this thing of this idea of God choosing people and not choosing people. What happens, what happens to us is for some people, uh, that, scarifies, that, that's, that, that scares them. It terrifies them. What if I'm not chosen? What if I'm just not one of the, I, I want to be chosen, but God won't choose me. That, that scares people. Then there's, there's other people that, that, that hear this and they, and, and it's, they like go to the other extreme. They're like, oh, I'm definitely chosen. I mean, why wouldn't God choose me? I am awesome. And not only did he choose me, pooey on you. Who knows if he chose you or not? He goes, I know he chose me. And they, they, they go to the other extreme. That, this is not what Paul is talking about at all. And I want to be honest with you, I struggled. I, I wouldn't say struggle. I mean, I've always accepted the fact that, that, there's, that, that God chooses people and people have free will. And the idea of where those two things come together, uh, you know, God's predestination, our ability to choose. If, if someone could explain where those two things marry one another, I mean, they, they could write a magnificent book. Nobody can explain it. But you know what? When I adopted, when Cherry and I adopted our sons, I, I began to have a much clearer understanding of what this is all about. Because let me tell you something. When you go and adopt a child, you're choosing a child. They didn't do anything. They didn't, they didn't do anything to be chosen except that they existed. That's it. And a mom and a dad, a family chooses a child. And they adopt them. And they bring them into the fold. But it only works if the child chooses the parent too. Do you follow it only, there's only, the, the only real relationship that's ever going to happen is if it goes both ways. If it goes both ways. So here's, here's, the, here's the way to look at this, okay? I'm just a guy, okay? I can't, I can't explain the deep, the deep stuff of God. But, but here's, here's how I reconcile this. I think God pretty much chose everyone. Problem is, they all haven't chosen him. Paul's talking about in this passage, he's simply saying, this is how I know you've been chosen because I see these things coming from you. But, but what you and I need to understand is that salvation begins with God, just as adoption begins with, God, with, with the parent, right? It's not the child that woos the parent. It's the parent who walks in and says, I will initiate this relationship. I choose you. But they have a free will. They may or may not ever choose the parent. And that's what Paul is talking about in this passage. And some people, listen, even uh, potentially some sitting in this room and watching online right now, those that have been in church a long time, they will take this, this doctrine of, of predestination and they will say, this is why we shouldn't share the gospel with other people. Because if God is choosing people, what difference does it make if I share my faith or don't share my faith, if I give for, for the gospel to be shared or don't give for the gospel to be shared, if I pray for people to be saved or if I don't pray for people to be, what difference does it make because God chooses who he chooses. They have completely manipulated this and twisted it to make it say something that it's not saying. 
And there's proof of this. If we go back into Acts, and I don't have time to, to, for us to look at the passage this morning, but in Acts, uh, Paul, on one of his missionary journeys, was starting a church in Corinth. And, and so it was, a, it was a godless city filled with, with people who knew nothing of Jesus Christ and, and didn't want to know anything of Jesus Christ. And he, and he went there, and he began to preach the gospel. And you know what? They weren't that friendly to him. And, and Paul began to doubt he began to doubt the, this idea of maybe, maybe I should move on. Maybe I shouldn't preach here in Corinth anymore. It's getting, it's getting kind of tough here. And the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 16 that one night he went to sleep and God spoke to him in a dream. And in that dream, God said to Paul, he said, you're right where you need to be. In fact, I have many people in this city I have chosen for myself. And then the verse ends by saying that Paul stayed there another year and a half preaching the gospel. Well, if God had chosen them, why didn't Paul just move on? Why didn't Paul just wake up and say, Phew, I don't have to worry about this anymore. God's already chosen these people. I can move on to somebody else. I can miss all this hardship. I can miss all this persecution. I can miss going through the trouble that I'm encountering right now because God's already chosen people. He just told me. I don't have to stay here and tell them about Jesus. But that's not what happened. He woke up and said, oh, there's people here. I'm going to preach harder. I'm going to share the gospel more because I know there are people here that God loves. That's how you and I should be approaching our neighbors, our coworkers, our family members. Yes, God has chosen them. We're waiting on them to choose him. And we share the gospel along the way. This is what saved people do. This is what they know about themselves and their own salvation and how things have unfolded. There's a fourth thing that, that you and I can find in this passage to let us know that, that we've been saved, and that is that salvation makes us a living review of the good news. A living review of the good news. Notice what it says in verse 6 through 8. You welcome the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you. Notice what it says. They welcomed it. They, they became a model by, by which others could, could follow. And the Lord's message rang out from them. When someone's been saved by Christ, this is what begins to happen to them. They welcome the truth of Scripture into their life. Then they begin to model that truth. And then it begins to ring out of their life. There's um, an act in Las Vegas. I, I don't know if they're still active or not. Um, Pin and Tell. You guys ever heard of Pin and Tell? If you've been around a while, you might know who Pin and Tell is. They do a, um, they're like a magician slash comedy act in Vegas. And uh, one, of the, one of the guys is Pin Gillette. Pin Gillette is the guy that, that uh, he's the uh, pin part of Pin and Tell. <laughs> and um, he, is, he is an atheist. Um, but I want you to watch a video, something that he put out a couple of years ago about something that happened after one of his shows. A man approached him and, and gave him a Bible. And, and so Penn tells this encounter. Let, let's watch this together. And he walked over to me and he said, uh, I was here last night at the show and uh, I saw the show and I liked it. I wanted, and he was very complimentary about my use of language and um, complimentary about, you know, honesty and stuff. He said nice stuff. No reason to go into it. He said nice stuff. And then he said, I brought this for you. And he handed me a uh, Gideon pocket edition. Um, I 
thought it said from the New Testament, but I also thought it was Psalms from the New Testament, right? Or, uh, Psalms from the New, just part of the New Testament. Little book about this big, this thick, you know. He said, I wrote in the front of it, and I wanted you to have this. I'm kind of uh, proselytizing. I mean, he said, I'm a businessman. I'm, I'm sane. I'm not crazy. And he looked me right in the eye and did all of this. And uh, it was really wonderful. I believe he knew that I was an atheist. But he was not uh, defensive, and he looked me right in the eyes. And he was truly complimentary. It wasn't in any way, it didn't seem like empty flattery. He was really kind and nice and sane and looked me in the eyes and talked to me and then gave me this Bible. And I've always said, you know, that I, I don't respect people who don't proselytize. I don't respect that at all. If you believe that there's a heaven and hell and people could be going to hell or not getting eternal life or whatever, and you think that, uh, well, it's not really worth telling them this because it would make it socially awkward. And atheists who think that people shouldn't proselytize, just leave me alone, keep your religion to yourself. Uh, how much do you have to hate somebody to not proselytize? How much do you have to hate somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? I mean, if I believed beyond a shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe it, that, that truck was bearing down on you, there's a certain point where I tackle you. And this is more important than that. And I've always thought that, and I've written about that, and I've thought of it conceptually. This guy was a really good guy. He was polite and honest and sane, and he cared enough about me to proselytize and give me a, a Bible, which had written in it a little note to me, uh, not very personal, but just, you know, like to show and so on. And then like five phone numbers for him and an email address if I wanted to get in touch. Now, I know there's no God, and one polite person living his life right doesn't change that. Uh, but I'll tell you, he was a very, very, very good man. And uh, that's really important. And with that kind of goodness, uh, it's okay to have that deep of a disagreement. I still think that religion does a lot of bad stuff, but man, that was a good man who gave me that book. That's all I want to say. So literally what happened is that salvation, it makes us a living review of the good news. You know what a review is, right? You know people write reviews all the time? He was writing a review of someone that came and shared the gospel with him. And that's what you and I do. That's what, that's what saved people do. This is how you know. This is how you know. You know, you just, you find ways for, you, you welcome the gospel, you model it, and then you let it ring out. And you know what? There's going to be times that we encounter people that we don't convince them. But they still can respect who we are. So I think you get, I think you get the point. There's, a, there's another, there's a fifth way that you and I can know that we're saved, and that is that salvation causes us to repeatedly recognize and turn away from our idols. Salvation causes us to repeatedly recognize and turn away from our idols. In verse 9, Paul wrote to these Thessalonian believers, he said, you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. That doesn't happen just once. That happens over and over and over again in our lives. 
Anytime we recognize that something is out of priority in our life, something has, has moved into the position that has become the most important thing in our life, and it is no longer Jesus Christ. We must turn from that idol and turn back to the living God. And Paul is saying to the Thessalonians, I've seen you do that. I've seen you do that. I've seen you turn from your idols. Now, as we go through this together, we're going to talk a lot about idols uh, in, the, in, in these passages that, that are going to be coming in the next couple of weeks. But without a doubt, we have idols in our life. It may look different than what we imagine uh, because of what we know about uh, antiquity and, and the Bible times and how people actually had little statues and little things. And those aren't our idols, okay? For, for us sitting here, for the majority of us watching online, we don't have little statues that, that we pray to or turn to or speak to or, or whatever. Our idols are much different. And so I just, I just want to give you a, a, little, a little sample of, of modern idols that, that you and I might have. One might be yourself. You love yourself more than you love anything. Generally, we tend to see that in somebody else and not ourselves. But can I just tell you, we are all very prone to loving ourselves more than we love anything. And that can be an idol. That's why the Bible says over and over again, take up your cross daily and follow Jesus. Self-denial. If you're not denying yourself, yourself is your idol. Period. Another, another idol that you and I might have is our political ideals. It's not too heated right now, but uh, next year this time, it's going to be pretty hot and heavy about political ideals. For the last two election cycles, I've seen believers over and over again choose their political ideals over the truth of Scripture. And sometimes that becomes an idol. We have to be careful. Another idol that, that you and I might have is just comfort. Just the idea of being comfortable. Man, we love it. In fact, I think we're the softest nation in the world right now. We love our comforts. We love them. And if anyone, anyone tries to take our comforts, who are they to do that? What right do they have? It doesn't take long to rile us up. And for many, it becomes their idols. Sometimes it's a relationship, you know, uh, it can, you know, if you're not married, many times it's, it's the person you're dating, you know, and, and the idea of being with them and keeping them in the right place. After you, you know, get married, then it becomes family. A lot of times family becomes an idol to people, the expectations of family and how family wants us to live or not live. That, that can be a, an idol in people's lives. Uh, sometimes it's money. Consumerism, I, I believe without a doubt consumerism is an idol that we have just grown up in and we have totally accepted the whole idea that says if they don't have what I'm looking for, I don't need to be, I don't need to be a part of that. People treat church that way all the time, all the time. And that becomes an idol in our life. Uh, the, the hope and the, the promises that we think money can provide, that can become an idol. I, I think probably the most common idol is our smartphones. Without it, you, can't, you, you can't go anywhere without it. I can't get more specific than that. We can't, we can't seem to function without them. The idea of not being connected, of not having knowledge instantly at our fingertip is an idol. I can't trust anything with God. I need to know. I need to know what's going on with everyone all the time. And you know what? If I, if I need to be reminded, I can set alerts on it. It's an idol. You say, oh, you're, 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 you're being too extreme, Pastor. Try leaving it at home. See if I'm being that extreme. We can't, we can't do it. We all have idols. Folks, I want to tell you something. To follow Jesus Christ will always cost us something. 
If following Jesus is not costing you something, you're not following Jesus. Period. If you are completely comfortable in your walk with the Lord and you can't find one thing in your life that you had to give up to follow him, you are not following him. Period. Because we must constantly be giving up our idols. And Paul says, I've seen that in this group of people. There's a sixth thing. Salvation makes us aware of Jesus' return. He closes out this first chapter by saying, You turn to God to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who rescues us from the coming wrath. Folks, those who have been saved are keenly aware of a sense of accountability for how they live their life. They know that Jesus is coming back. And because they are keenly aware of his return, there's this sense of accountability as to how they should live their life. That, that I must give an account for, for how I'm, I'm living and, and the choices that I'm making and the things that I'm doing and the, the priorities that I have and the pursuits and the, the dreams that, that I'm accountable to stand before the Lord one day and say, this is what I did with my life because he's coming back. He's coming back. And those that are saved, they can't shake that. They know it. They know it in their bones. And not only do they know that he's returning, there's also this deep sense inside that says, you know what? I need to be rescued. I am so capable of great sin. I need to be rescued. I need for him to come back because I'm not sure I can keep up the good fight. I don't know if you ever think about that, but I think about it. And day by day, that's, that's how we make it, one day at a time. Because I'm telling you, in any given day, I'm capable of great sin. And I, I need to be rescued from that. And saved, saved people know this. They know this. They know this about themselves. And these are the things that Paul saw in this group of believers and and we're going to learn more about them as we go through this. But he just starts off by encouraging them and saying, I know God chose you. And listen, here's, here's the thing. If you're sitting here this morning and, and you're a, you know you're a follower in Christ, you've been encouraged. But if you're sitting here this morning and you're thinking, oh my gosh, maybe there's something wrong with me. Maybe I've missed something. I would say get that straightened out. Let's pray together. And after we pray, I'll, I'll close our service. Let's pray. Father, we uh, have listened to your word and what it says. Lord, I pray now that we would turn our attention to responding to your word. What do you want us to do with what you've said to us? How are we supposed to respond to this? Father, as we move in to this part of being with you and with one another this morning. I pray that your spirit would speak to us. Lord, that we would not be motivated by fear or confusion. Lord, that it would not be some type of, of, of human, I don't know, manipulation or compulsion that causes any of us to do something or not do something but instead, Lord, that, that we would truly be just responding to you. Father, we, we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen.